Have you ever tried to make a positive change in your life but just couldn't seem to get that change to happen? I know that I have. As a self-development and productivity nerd, I'm always trying to find ways to get myself to study more, to eat healthier, and to actually stick to my workout routine. But as you probably know, the journey to self-improvement is rarely a smooth one. What I found in my experience, and you're likely the same too, is that the barriers we face to change are rarely physical. Instead, we often get tripped up by psychological hurdles. We give in to our desire for immediate gratification. We get distracted by other things and forget what it is we were supposed to do that day. Or very simply, we lack the motivation and confidence to even get started on the change that we want to make. But the good news is that it doesn't have to stay that way. My guest this week is one of my favorite researchers in the field, Professor Katie Milkman. And her new smash hit book, How to Change, The Science of Going from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be, is packed full of great scientific tips that can help you achieve your long-term goals. So in this video, Professor Milkman and I are going to go through four science-based self-improvement tips to help you achieve achieve your goals. Let's get started. Speaking of getting started, this is often one of the first problems that many of us face. We simply lack the motivation to actually start making the change that we want to see in our lives. But Professor Milkman suggests that to overcome this, we can take advantage of something called the fresh start effect. Yeah, the fresh start effect is something I've studied with Heng Chen Dai, professor at UCLA's Anderson School of Management, and Jason Reese, a senior fellow here at Wharton. And what we found is that there are moments in our lives when we're more motivated to pursue our goals and to pursue change than others. And those moments arrive at chapter breaks in our lives, moments that feel like a new beginning or a fresh start, which is why we call it the fresh start effect. So you know of New Year's resolutions, so you know about the New Year's effect. But what we found is that there's a broader set of dates, including the start of a new week or a new month, the uh, celebration of a birthday or of holidays that feel meaningful and like fresh starts to us, they give us the sense that we're closing one chapter in our lives, opening another, and they make us more likely to step back and think big picture about our goals. They make us more likely to feel like, you know, that was the old me who didn't achieve these goals last year or last week. And the new me can do it. We feel this dissociation. So we're more likely to do things like visit the gym after these fresh start dates. We're more likely to search for the term diet on Google. We're more likely also to set goals on a popular goal setting website about everything from health and wellness to our financial security, to our education, to the environment. And so these fresh start dates give us that impetus to change our behavior and are a great opportunity for anyone looking to change to, to leap on in order to get that change kickstarted. The second problem that many of us face is that we tend to succumb to immediate gratification. This is one of the most important findings from behavioral science is that people tend to overweight immediate rewards that they can get, which makes engaging in those behaviors that help us achieve our long-term goals really difficult. But rather than trying to use your willpower to overcome these desires for immediate gratification, what if you could leverage this bias to your own advantage? That's what Katie Milkman suggests in her technique called temptation bundling. Temptation bundling is when you link something that is a temptation, a pleasure, like watching lowbrow TV shows with something that is normally a chore, like going to the gym. So you can temptation bundle your favorite podcasts with doing household chores. You can temptation bundle your favorite foods with studying. You can do all sorts of different temptation bundles in your life. And my research has shown that this is actually a, an effective tactic for helping you stick to your goals because now they're more instantly enjoyable. So am I right in saying that when you're not doing that hard behavior that you shouldn't be doing that same pleasurable activity? That is the idea that this temptation is reserved for the time when you are pursuing your goals. And so it will make goal pursuit more alluring. This third tip is to do with simple forgetfulness. How often have you got to the end of the day before you realize that that one thing that you were supposed to do today has just completely slipped your mind? I know that this has happened to me a lot and we have good data to suggest that this happens to a lot of other people too. Now, common solutions to this problem are just to use reminders or task lists, something which I've been using in my own life to great effect. But Professor Milkman suggests another technique that might work even better and that's called cue-based planning. What is cue-based planning? 
Cubase planning is my preferred name for something that Peter Golwitzer of NYU psychology department has been studying for decades. He calls it implementation intentions. And it means forming a plan based on a queue, meaning you choose a date and time, for instance, and maybe a location where you're going to execute whatever the action is. So if you're thinking about you know, I, I should really get a flu shot. You don't just say, I'll do it at some point in the future. You say on this date, at this time, in this location, that is when I will get a flu shot. And it turns out to make you less likely to forget, more likely to follow through on your intentions. It's embedded more firmly in memory when you make that cue-based plan. And the cue also triggers recall when the moment and the location where you said you'd execute come up. And it's more of a firm commitment. It's harder to procrastinate on the firm commitment because now it, it breaks your commitment rather than simply a vague intention. Can you talk about the study with the alien and how that relates to cue based planning? I would love to. Yeah, this is research I did with Todd Rogers at the Harvard Kennedy School. And the idea was that the more vivid the cue, the more likely it is to trigger recall. And it, it was a very simple study we did to prove how useful it can be to use vivid cues in order to, to get yourself to follow through. So we gave people a dollar off coupon to their favorite coffee shop. When they came in on Tuesday, we said, do you want a dollar off for Thursday? 500 people said yes. And then we randomly assigned them to one of two experimental conditions. In the condition with the vivid cue, we showed them a plush alien and told them this plush alien will be stationed in front of the cash register tomorrow, or excuse me, on Thursday when you come into the coffee shop. And if you see the alien, remember, pull out your coupon. The other half of people in the experiment were told when you see the cash register on Thursday, remember to pull out your coupon. That will be your reminder. Of course, the cash register is boring. It's usually there. It doesn't stand out. It's not out of the ordinary, but the plush alien is very out of the ordinary. And even though it's there for everyone on Thursday, it's only a cue to pull out that coupon for half of people. And that half of people, not surprisingly, had a significantly higher rate of redeeming their coupons because the reminder that was in their path was vivid and memorable. Yeah, it's such a fun study. I love, I love the idea of having this plush alien as a reminder. Um, how would people take this insight and then apply it to their own behaviors that they're trying to change? Yeah, it's a great question. This particular insight simply suggests the kinds of cues that are most effective, I think, when you're forming a cue-based plan. So ideally, the cues that you associate with whatever it is you want to follow through on, whatever goal you want to achieve by breaking it down into step-by-step -step pieces, those should be vivid, right? So we didn't use signs, we didn't use cash registers, things that normally you see and ignore. We used a plush alien. So what are the vivid cues in your life? And by the way, they could be dates, speaking of the fresh start effect. What are the moments in your life that you're unlikely to forget? or the locations that are likely to trigger this realization that you should follow through or things that you can put out for yourself as a reminder, whatever they are, use the ones that are most vivid in order to form cue-based plans you're least likely to forget. And this fourth and final tip is to do with confidence. How often in life do you face a challenge that you simply just don't feel confident enough to tackle yet? Now, usually when that's the case, we tend to seek out the advice of others who are more knowledgeable than us so that we can feel equipped with the knowledge that we need in order to tackle the challenge. But Professor Milkwin suggests maybe there's a better way to do this, that instead of us trying to seek out others' advice, perhaps the best thing for us to do is actually to give someone else advice about the same topic and that can raise our confidence even more. Uh, many of us lack confidence in our abilities, but one way that we can overcome this, you say in your book, is to actually give advice about this. Uh, why does that work? Yeah, Lauren Eskris Winkler, who's about to be a faculty member at the Kellogg School of Management starting this summer, is the person who had this really interesting insight when she was doing her dissertation research. She noticed that Often we give people advice when they're struggling to achieve their goals and that can be demotivating, can make them feel like, gosh, you must not think I have a clue. But she wondered, what if we flip the script? What if instead of giving people advice in situations where it's not really a knowledge barrier, but rather a motivation barrier and a confidence barrier that separates people from their goals? What if we said, could you give someone else advice, put them in the position of mentor or advisor to someone else trying to achieve a similar goal. And the idea was that by putting you on a pedestal, 
It was going to make you feel more confident that you could follow through. And that might be really important to goal achievement, but also it had the magic ingredient of causing you to introspect more deeply than you usually would about what could work. So you might dredge up insights you wouldn't otherwise. And then finally, it's also going to lead you to feel like you should do this because if you've told someone else, here's my advice, it's going to feel hypocritical if you don't follow it yourself. So for all of those reasons, she thought it would be useful to encourage people to give advice to others. And she's now done a lot of research and I've gotten to do a little bit of it with her showing that when you put someone in the position of an advice giver, it improves their outcomes. There might be people in my audience thinking that's great advice, but I've got no one to give advice to. How do they use this insight in that scenario? Yeah, it's a great question. And I'll just say that one of the ways I've realized I'm using it in my own life is that I have an advice club. So a group of female academics at similar career stages with similar career goals. And we reach out to one another when we need advice on some career decision that we're struggling with. And there's lots of benefits of it. One is that we, you know, we learn from each other. Other people provide great suggestions. There's camaraderie. So there's all sorts of wonderful things that I expected that come through, but an unexpected benefit that I now see thanks to the work I've gotten to do with Lauren on the power of advice giving is that when I'm asked for advice by a colleague on an on an issue that they're facing, it boosts my confidence as I figure out a solution that, hey, I can actually come up with good answers when when I face a challenge like this, and also increases the likelihood that when I face the very same challenge, I will have a good plan that I'm very likely to execute on in order to solve the problem successfully. Okay, so those are all the tips from today's video. If you enjoyed today's video, then you should definitely check out Katie Milkman's new book, How to Change the Science of Going from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be. Now, I actually have two copies of the book, and so Professor Milkman gave me permission to give one away to one of you guys in the audience. So if you want to win a free copy of Professor Milkman's new book, go to my Instagram at PeteSpitzOfficial, follow me, like this photo and leave a comment and I'll choose one of those comments at random in the next week to win a copy of the book. Okay, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. I have 40 of them in my closet upstairs. My mom just wrote me because there's a book drive um at a local homeless shelter and she was like if you have books that you want to give away just let me know i was like how about 40 copies of (laughs) it